and good morning to those in Singapore. Speaking of Singapore, I remember my two trips to Singapore. One time was with a group of monks headed by a great lama, who was, I think, the designated successor to Gandhi and Tiba at that time. And the other one was just for fun. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, so without further, <laughs> further sharing, <laughs> let's uh, sit in quiet to calm our body and mind, bringing our awareness to the here and now. to wherever one is, physically. And then within that, let the mind be within the body. And there too, not think of anything else, but of the sensations of the body. If possible, just choose one particular type and let the mind focus on it at its own natural pace. And in being anchored, anchored to that object, try to do so, as I always say, alertly, attentively, ardently, or delightfully. Alertness helps in making the object as well as the subjective agent clear. Attention, of course, requires additional deliberate attention so that the mind doesn't get a free state. He say, rather, stay your cho chosen object that you choose. And then delightfully or ardently, in the sense of seeing the purpose, benefit behind this almost not doing anything at least in terms of our busy life. None of those have, have doings are happening here, and one is voluntarily making it so, hopefully with a sense of purpose, direction, and thus delight in it. Let all those combine together in staying quiet, calm, the mind, just following, say, breath at its natural rate. By way of enhancing our motivation for this session, I want to recall the prayers we said among them, the one about the qualities of the Buddha. There are so many qualities listed here. And, of course, primary among them is his skillfulness in teaching.
guiding us along the path to lasting happiness based on his own experience. And that too is complemented by his great compassion, great love, great skillfulness, all the positive qualities having reached full culminate, blossoming. Thinking over it, it gives us great hope. At the same time, it challenges us in terms of how real that might be and that requires us to initiate the process with an enthusiasm, with an interest in the Dharma. That's the first very step. And then once we are led into the fold, into the practice, into the action, in looking, seeing, confronting, encountering the Dharma, to the extent we put it into practice, we will begin to taste its truth, its joy, its peace. And then from there we could infer a little bit more and more. That's how along with our progress, we begin to see further and further. That's how we start with, in terms of actually authenticating the teachings. One thing very clear at the very start of our studies is how vast and how profound, how skillful, how multifaceted, multi-approach the teachings are. And then, as I said earlier, knowing that it's only by putting it into practice that the Dharma would have served its purpose to begin with, to start with, and then it will only grow as we continue with the practice consistently. So beginning with one's own personal practice, that leading to admiration and reverence to whoever you are receiving teachings from, learning from, primarily one's teacher, but as well as from one's co practitioners Dhamma's friends, in other words, the Sangha. And through that, one begins to generate faith, faith in the classical scriptures. And as one keeps on practicing, eventually, a very special, unique, unwavering faith in the Buddha will begin to emerge. And then we begin to see how what we are spoken of as the qualities of the Buddha, how wonderful and marvelous they were, begins to make sense and see the possibility of it. And that's the way to go about it. But at the very least, even when even just encountering the Dharma and listening to it, have some acquaintance with what the direction looks like, what the underpinning premise looks like, what the implications, ramifications look like, one begins to actually see some gem already in it. And then that becomes real when one practices it. So with this as a reminder, feel more enthused and more inspired in undertaking the practice. 
as well as in hearing the path to others, mostly through one's own examples. Somewhere I have come across this statement where in a family of Christians there was one member who was Buddhist. And I think it was a lady. I didn't I don't recall all the stories, but it came the gist of it came to this. The, the other family members were Christians. They were all in unison in saying that when you were Buddha, we like it. When you were Buddhist, we didn't like you. So being Buddha and being Buddhists with a sense of bias, with a sense of dif distinction, separation, this can be done, this can be done, this, etc., etc., all those that come with a sense of, sense of a new, different, attire, if you will, external attire for the self-centeredness, self-grasping, that still remains irritable, irritating to others. But if we really try our best in following the Buddha, not just in what he has taught, but how he would have behaved in a particular situation, not just physically, but more importantly, mentally, then yes, not only one oneself will feel peace, but others will also begin to appreciate and begin to feel it. So with these sharings, feel more enthused and encouraged to be the change you want to be, particularly by following the Buddhist path. And that way, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be merely left to praying for others to be happy, but also be actually contributing to the joy and happiness, the true of very long-term, long-lasting joy and happiness of the others. And in this, the most we can do, the utmost we can do is by becoming Buddhas ourselves. At the very least, following his path and being an example of how Buddha would be at any given, given instant, given moment, go long, far in really making a difference. Let this be the inspiration behind that, this session that we have together. As short as this life, is can be even shorter, but this is a great opportunity for us to come together and share something very precious, Dharma. What could be more precious than this? So with this, Let's uh, pick up from where we were last time. Before we move on to the reflection, on page 281, I want to review the last uh, quotation from Dharmakirti once more. Uh, there's little more to that that I didn't share last time. The first one reads, All flaws that are susceptible to dec decrease and increase have their counterforce. 
it's because of the counterforce that you begin to see the decrease and increase of the flaws that we are susceptible to. And that means something about the relationship between the counterforce and the afflictions. Because why would the counterforce, when appearing or when becoming strong, makes the flaw decrease? Why, in the absence of it, makes the flaw increase? This points to some kind of a unique relationship between the two. And thus, following, following it, following it, we begin to see how cultivating the counterforce, inculcating the counterforce upon the mind, in the means of, in, in, in the sense of making the counterforce more and more part and parcel of your mind, and let it have more inroad into the mind. When you do that, the counterforce will become inclined into the nature of the mind itself. Not like the afflictions. Afflictions, no matter how entrenched they may be, they cannot be as inclined as a validly established counterforce can become or can get can get uh, can get into the nature of the mind. And that is the reason why some beings can eliminate pollutants. So this is in this is the response that Dharmakirti gives uh, to the objection uh, raised by the opponents, saying, as much as you talk big about abandoning afflictions, cessations of this kind and that kind, but I doubt that such a cessation can ever be obtained, because looking around, we see how, how much we try, it keeps reverting back. So this could also happen the same in this case. So there, Tamakirti is saying, no, here is a difference. The counterforce we are bringing forth is very different than what you are talking of. The counterforce is diametrically opposite to the root of the afflictions in the form of ignorance. And because of that, even at the very initial stages also, we begin to see this, see this, almost like shaking of the ground of the afflictions. As soon as the counterforce arises and increases, it begins to decrease, it begins to lose its grip. And so this counterforce that the Dhammakriti is suggesting, although at his uh, tenet, at his level of philosophical uh, affiliation, uh, the, the the constitution of even jikta, the, person, the grasping at personal identity, even the main content of it would be different, but the framework can be applicable even at the Prasangika Mahatmika school. So, the same under the same name of jikta, under the same name of grasping at personal identity, for lack of a better way of calling it, or for lack of a better, shorter, crispy way of calling it. <laughs> in Tibetan, Jigta is so compressed, but in English, when you try to convey the word as well as the meaning, it becomes naturally elongated. Then that Whenever you mention it, it doesn't seem like a name. It's like someone is making a whole statement. <laughs> That's why it's always a challenge. So, so, so that's what it's saying. The, the counterforce we're bringing in is something that you haven't even heard of, let alone he hearing about it. You advocate the exact opposite of it. By, by accepting a, a permanent, unitary, independent self outside of the aggregates. It's not even close to what I'm proposing. And then when it comes to Prasangya Madhya 
present uh, and take, then it becomes even deeper, which kind of really zooms in to really squarely fit with the ignorance in such a way that now the ignorance has no, what do you call, uh, no space to pass. Every spot is, every spot, every, it is squarely kind of what you call, mm -hmm. clamped down by the, by the counterpose. So, so mainly the counterforce being spoken of here is jikta, uh, the 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 wisdom of understanding, uh, the wisdom of understanding selflessness, <laughs> and the flaw here being called out is not just. Of course, all the afflictions are included in it, but among them, the general of them, the the director general of them, <laughs> in the form of ignorance, is called out. Yeah. So that's the reason why there is there is the possibility of uh, attaining cessation of an affliction, rendering it completely irreversible once for all. And then the op yeah the the first allegation was that such a situation is not possible at all. So this is their response. And then to this response, the 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 reaction was well, however well said it is, <laughs> nonetheless, in the practical level, such, such a situation cannot be possible. It will only revert back. And the question was, in what way are you saying that it could revert back? Just by itself? Or by seeing some fault in the so-called cessation? Or by not seeing neither fault nor qualities in it? So the, the Dharmakirti is presenting three options. On what ground are you saying that such a cessation generated by such a counterforce in the form of the wisdom understanding, the direct wisdom understanding directly the selflessness. On what ground are you saying that uh, such a cessation could still revert back? By seeing fault in it? Or by not seeing fault but neither seeing qualities in it? Or, by, or of its own? On its own? Would it revert back on its own for no reason? So there the response was this next stanza where it reads uh, in my rendition here. The agonies of samsara are absent and the flawless state is present. Even if a mind deluded on reality were to counteract it, it, the cessation would not be reversed, not, not, would not even budge would not be reversed. Because by that time, the mind is now so naturally inclined towards this new force, new focus. So he's, so Dharmakirti is uh, responding by saying that you cannot say that when someone attains such a cessation, they would have, they could still find any fault with it. Because this cessation is such a cessation where once you attain it, the agonies of samsara are gone. Now, where would you point faults at? And then if you say you may not find fault, but you do not see any qualities in it. No, a flawless state is present. Such a state of cessation generated by an understanding of wisdom uh, in uh, wisdom rooted in the understanding of the reality as it is in the final in the final uh, ultimate uh, state such a cessation has very many qualities and when one has such a cessation 
one could not escape but see it, feel it, experience it. So that's the reason why the cessations have these qualities of Gokpa, cessation, Shiva, peace, Gokpa Shiva, Kyanum, splendor, I think, or resourcefulness. I don't know, Kyanum. Kyanum means everything present, all qualities present. If you speak of a meal, Janumba meal will be a sumptuous meal. <laughs> so Janumba, Goba Shiva Janumba. Ngejung. Ngejung. Ngebar Junga is a cessation which now cannot or would not let any of its afflictions revert back. It is a definite, definite freedom. Yeah, definite freedom. So those are the qualities inescapably present in such a state. And if one were to look for qualities or even just have those sensations, there's no way one would have missed them. So none of those stand. Now, if you say of its own it will revert, that will not be also the case, because by that time, the mind is now naturally inclined towards this new focus. Unlike this fake, uh, fake thing that it has been so lost into, self-worth, and totally ungrounded in reality, but you got so so enthused, so enthralled by it, so much so that you have been holding on to it up until now with no with no significant change for the better at all. Whereas this one, though it is a new new finding, but it is far better than what the mind had been so so lost into, so mistakenly enthralled by. And it is such a force that it has more chance in naturally becoming inclined towards the nature of the mind. It's almost like because of its grounded in reality with the support of the truth, once the mind comes across it, which is which takes time for mind to be talked into it, because having been so betrayed <laughs> by the ignorance, uh, so fooled by it, it would take some time to kind of get to know the new friend and 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 uh, welcome him in. But once you do, you begin to realize your eyes will open up, and you will begin to see really. The, the great jewel that it is, and thus the mind would naturally be inclined towards it. So much so that it would open all the doors to it and become almost part of it. So now here it is almost saying that uh, the, the realities have be, have chance, not just better, but even not, not just better chance, not, not better chance, but they have, or you could say better chance, they have the chance to to kind of stick to the mind almost to the point of its core nature and be there forever. The Tibetan word used is Nangi, uh, Rangi, Nangi. Tartu Rangi, Nangi, Dobur Juham. No, no. Uh, it uses Ngangi, it uses the Ngangi, but Ngangi not in this context, but in other context. <laughs> uh, where is it? So, yeah, it says that uh, the, the mind is just as in venerable condition, it's, it's inclined, naturally, the mind is naturally inclined towards its nature, uh, towards its nature. So, the mind is naturally inclined towards its nature. The mind of understanding selflessness is naturally inclined towards the nature of the mind, whereas afflictions only get to stay 
outside the nature of the mind. They are not the nature of the mind. They are just mere adventitious, what do you call it? Uh, adventitious, uh, strengths of it, around it, but not in any part of its nature. Yeah, so before we move on to the reflections, which are really, really, very really important and very uh, kind of thought-provoking and uh, inspiring to contemplate on, uh, since we are moving to a, another phase, uh, after having touched on the clear light nature of mind, I want to finally share <laughs> from the Seventh Dalai Lama's commentary on the sutra that we read, we recite. We 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 are calling it the wisdom gone beyond, right? Okay, yeah. Somewhere else it's called the wisdom at the hour of death. So there. Uh, There, the clearer, clear, luminous nature of mind is, uh, as we're all familiar, is uh, likened to uh, sky. But here, the uh, here, the the sutra being in the context of sutra, it only uh, res what do you call resorts to two versions of the clarity of mind. One in the clear luminous nature of mind. When we say the mind is clear light in nature, that clear light in the sutra system is understood on mainly in two ways. One, in terms of the mind itself being at its very core luminous and undefined, luminous and aware, and thus uh, no afflictions having uh, gotten inroad into it. So in that sense, it is clear light in nature. The another way of, uh, uh, or the additional way, it doesn't have to replace the previous one. The previous one is as, uh, as viable as the next one also, except the, the ramification, the significance would differ. In the second case, when you say the the mind is clear light in nature, then that clear light is not a compounded phenomena like the before one, like the previous, but an uncompounded. It is referring to the mind's uh, ultimate nature of emptiness. And uh, here, mm -hmm. here, both of them, both of both of these uh, approaches or iteration are addressed. One was by by likening it to sky. Now here, oh yeah, not sky. Sometimes it's sky, but this is not sky. Oh, same girl. She two 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 about times it and two. Two times it in the look. No, he may be good. Not capa. Rangshin la luburki. Topa kangi ja depa. Yeah, this one is in doing with the uh, the later version, the later way of uh, interpreting the clear light, which is in the spirit of emptiness. The the nature of mind uh, in emptiness uh, or in different uh, uh, respective schools, their own. Uh, their own take of what the uh, ultimate nature constitutes. That is the same Gerangashi, and that is Tupatamjit uh, Dajava, that is free from all, all fabrications. People translate it as elaborations, but it's so strange, right? elaborations. Uh, it can make sense. Mm, fabrications, 
exaggerations, overestimation, underestimation, but more so in the sense of overestimation. The mere absence of that fabrication, that level of fabrication. Likewise, sky is likened to this in that it is, now here it is the uncompounded sky, uncompounded space, that it is mere lack of the abstraction, abstractiveness, nothing but that. Just in, in Tibetan, in the scriptures, we use this term, rapto cheva, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like you're using a sharp weapon and you're cutting it, and it's just cut there, it is not, nothing stands away from it, not even a single strand. And then when you have to include many things, then Riksu, Riksu Nepa, then so much is included in it, no, not explicitly mentioned. <laughs> then you have a very easy yeah, way to, get, to go about your defense. <laughs> Uh, something, 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 Riksu Nepa means uh, then this and others like this. <laughs> what are the others like it? You just come up with your objection and then I will include them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but when you say Raptu Cheva, then now you have already locked yourself in and you have to stick to that. So that's like what emptiness is, and so is the uncompounded, uncompounded space. Nothing but mere absence of the abstractiveness. The aspect of mere absence of the abstractiveness. And then another way is another an, another thing is this uh, this nature of emptiness is something that pervades all phenomena. Not just it pervades all phenomena, but the nature of emptiness. When it comes to the emptiness aspect of a phenomena, all of them have not the slightest difference. It's the same. The emptiness of the deluded mind and the emptiness of the omniscient mind. When it comes to the emptiness, the criteria of emptiness itself, it's exactly the same. There's not the slightest difference. So maybe it is making the case that, likewise, the mere obstruction, the mere lack of obstructiveness, no matter of whichever vacuity you are talking of, it will be the same. It's not that the mere absence of obstructiveness of this vacuity is different than that vacuity. <laughs> so in terms of the mere lack of obstructiveness, it has the same test all over. Rangshin lubu ki tok pa kangi jang ma le pe yo se wa. And that, and that this, this mere absence of inherent existence is completely free and not defiled by any defilements alluding to the nature of the thing. And here it's interesting, some, in some references, as I shared before also, the inherent existence itself, a non-existent, do you call it thing, non-existent thing? <laughs> a non-existent one. Itself is considered a Defilement itself is considered a dirt, a defilement. Because if it were to exist, that would be the biggest defilement. <laughs> that would be the biggest defilement. That would be the biggest obstruction. So that's how its abstinence is celebrated by calling that if it were to exist, it would have been the greatest defilement. <sighs> oh, we are free from it, like that. <laughs> so it is, it is called, despite the fact that it is not existing, it is called a defilement. There's such a kind of a defilement which cannot defile anything. Well, the grasping of it does defile, but the, 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 the defilement itself cannot defile. Why to defile? It has to exist. Yeah. 
because it would be saying I am because I I defile, therefore I am. <laughs> it wouldn't it cannot say that because it can't defile. It is not there. But nonetheless, the scriptures and then anyway, okay. So likewise, I already spoke about the, the, the uncompounded space part in the in the case of the third uh, comparison of its of its being of its being undefiled, the the, the space, the, the the uncompounded space, along with its base. You may remember in the Buddhist scriptures. I think this this is the case with all the schools of Buddhist tenets, irrespective. Whatever they consider as takpa, permanent, has to have an impermanent base necessarily. Has to have an impermanent base. So for this permanent space, uncompounded space, the vacuity is the base. Without the vacuity, you cannot speak of absence of obstruction. <laughs> absence of obstruction, the mere absence of obstruction will be there where there is a vacuity. And that vacuity is compounded because you can you can change it. You bring things, vacuity becomes smaller. You leave, you take things away, vacuity becomes <laughs> larger, like that. So, so it's saying that uh, now, yeah. So here it is saying that even if the space, the the general space of the sky, uh, were to have clouds in it and uh, obstructing the sun, etc., etc., uh, from us, etc. But when it comes to the mere absence, uh, the the, even the vacuity included, but the mere absence of any obstruction, uh, there would be no no change whatsoever. It would not have changed a bit, a bit, or without this cloud uh, obstructing it. Okay, I think that should be fine. And, uh, there is another uh, analogy drawn between. Sun. And here, with regard to emptiness, it is saying that some jinji nang or matong or some le, ni me yose jing o la tibi o me yome kya me. Emptiness is everywhere. Everywhere. Even if you run away from it, you cannot. <laughs> you run because you have the emptiness of the leg. <laughs> You speak because you have the emptiness of the speaking faculties, speaking organ systems. Otherwise, you cannot speak. You just cannot do without emptiness. But sentient beings don't see it. So, likewise, it's saying the clouds may may obstruct the sun and keep us from seeing it. With the cloud in between us, the sun would not have changed at all. It would be still shining out there. It's amazing, like when we sometimes fly and fly above the sky, above the whatever sphere it is where <laughs> uh, the clouds form, then it's always sunny day. Not just sunny, very hot sunny day. <laughs> okay, I think I should not indulge in it so much. It should be fine. Yeah, but this commentary by Seventh Dalai Lama, uh, this is the first one in the form of a scripture of Seventh Dalai Lama, who, who was considered to be non, not non-sectarian, but neither sectarian in the bad sense, <laughs> but very strict. Uh, should I say pure, even? Hello. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, nonetheless, very, very good practitioner as well as a very good scholar. Anyway, we'll leave it there. So now I'm done with this file that I've been so long opening, 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 not getting to use it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what I was going to say about the last two stanzas was uh, to make the claim is okay, is one thing. But to actually kind of uh, verify it with one's actual experience is another thing, and that's the more important thing. And that's where one has to really weigh uh, this, 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 this counterforce that is being proposed. Say, in the case of the Buddha, that would be an uh, unprecedented counterforce being proposed, even spoken of. Selflessness would be a new thing. What? What did we hear? They would all be saying, Buddha saying, what? Selflessness? How could, how could he dare to say this? All around us just takes this for granted. Everything we believe in is based on this. Be that life after and life, karma, everything has to be on the basis of this solid I, which doesn't change. All the rest could change, but this cannot. And this can keep on going. How would the going, how would the going be possible in Buddha if there is no self? Who goes? Where does it go? That's it. This would have been a totally new thing, right? If it were to be this time, I mean, all the internet would be filled with this news and would stay for months together. But Buddha stood firm. Yes, I meant it. And not just he himself was the actual proof of it, but so many practitioners followed him and verified it. But that is not enough. We have to verify it ourselves. So, yeah, anyway, this is really a dig, deep dig that Venerable has done from the first chapter of Dharma Kirti. It's almost towards the end of the first chapter. Very hardly we go to that end, of, to that part of the first chapter. We'll focus on the opening ones, more important, more rele relevant to the to the mode of syllogisms and whatnot, and then go to the second one where it deals about these topics much more detail. But here it is a very two stanza, but very succinct, succinct, and very, very comprehensive, very forceful. Okay, that said, today I'll be today I'll be good with time. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Let's review the. The chapter by looking at the reflections. Reflect that the basic or true nature of the mind is pure and untainted. So. What would that mean? How is that possible, particularly given what I go through, what I experience with my mind? And what, how come there are some openings where I, turn, I tend to be not my... Well, not my angry self, that I'm so... so that I am mostly right. So, so if one happens to be a very angry person, so much so that people would call and you, you yourself would accept that this is my nature. <laughs> he, he is an angry person. This means he has the nature of being anger, angry. So, that's like collating, uh, conflating the two together. Person with the, to that extent of uh, almost becoming his nature. So, how in the Midst of that, sometimes you have these openings, you have these 
state of being, state of mind, you don't really believe that it's in you, where the mere purity of it kind of shows science shines forth and affects you and your way of relating with people. How sometimes you yourself catch it, how others catch it. So those are all indications of how mind in its very basic nature is is undefiled. And particularly approach this by looking at how the afflictions come about, what they are built of, what they are composed of, what they are based on. Per the Buddhist claim, they are all based on misunderstandings. Except we got so so fooled by it that we have been blindly following it, blindly believing it. But now it's time to be disillusioned by it and rise over and above it. So this is really very worth reflecting on and coming to terms with. And even if it is difficult to kind of struggle with it, question it, and wonder about it, question it, check it against one's own experiences. And yes, I think there can be uh, evidence to this, that yes, the purity of the mind can be, can be, uh, can be revealed, can be experienced, can be, can be brought up and made to last longer and longer and longer and longer, and let and make the occurrence of afflictions lesser and lesser. That is possible with change. So then, the second reflection: consider that the afflictions that plague your mind and cause so many disturbances in your life are adventitious. They are not embedded in the nature of the mind. Being not embedded to the nature in the nature of the mind is, to begin with, even the so-called uh, positive qualities, so long as they remain as qualities in the scriptures or qualities being talked about, then they have not even come into the purview of the mind, let alone be embedded into the nature of the mind. So on that regard, the, ex the disturbances, the mental disturbances, afflictions, and these, the qualities being talked about are equal. But the difference is the afflictions, the afflictions, they are rooted in misunderstanding. So this is a very important revelation, uh, important uh, insight to be had, to be experienced, and kind of really push it to its furthest truth by seeing not just grasping at a totally unconnected with the aff grasping at a self that is totally different from the aggregates. Not just grasping at a self that may be within the within the that may be uh, what do you call as linked to within the aggregates but nonetheless still seen as something over and above the aggregates, right? Or some other way of uh, looking at it. Not just be content with exposing them, but to kind of push it furthest to the grasping at inherent existence. How afflictions invariably are dependent on it for its life. And they can sometimes be dependent additionally on the grasping at permanence, when things are impermanent, grasping at grasping at 
unfounded pleasure or unfounded joy when in, it is in the nature of dukkha, etc., etc. So afflictions can sometimes be, some of the afflictions can be additionally be dependent on, on others for their sustenance, but invariably all of them are dependent on this grasping at inherent existence. So that truth has to really come out for oneself through one's own experience. And then, and then for that, the first thing is first to recognize what, what not just anger is, but what its underpinning self-grasping is. And once you have recognized it and how it is not in alignment with truth, then one will begin to see, yes, not only it is such a contributing factor to the afflictions, but itself is so grounded on totally unfounded, unfounded thing. So there is so much fact in it. Consider the afflictions that plague your mind. First of all, you have to agree that yet afflictions plague my mind. There are so many in the world who could just embrace it. They see them as their strength. And they see them to be everything. The force, the strength, whatever they are pursuing and they admire. They only see one way of achieving it, by being arrogant, by being proud, by being uh, belligerent, by being angry, by etc., etc., by being forceful, aggressive, etc. It's, it's the first point, fall with it, and then, and then see another way, another more lasting, meaningful, uh, and reasonable uh, way of getting what one want, which is joy and happiness. And also, I also associate them with the disturbances in one's life. See the root of one's disturbances, one's uh, unhappiness, one's uh, confusion, etc., in these afflictions. Now, the third one is reflect that it is possible to cultivate powerful antidotes to each and every affliction and obscuration. To this expression, to each and every affliction, there can be on occasions, one particular antidote that can be an antidote to all, each and every afflictions at once. But then there can be individual antidotes as well that can help address the problem, though temporarily, but quite strongly. But when it comes to cultivating the wisdom of emptiness, then that's kind of an antidote that can counteract all afflictions, each and every affliction, without a, without exception. And also there are some antidotes. One antidote is to take one's attention away from what is disturbing you, <laughs> overlooking it. Yeah, William James, really makes a big deal about overlooking. He says, genius are those who know what to overlook when you need to. I'm not quoting him at Corbettum, but yeah, at one time I was really taken in, taken into William James. Wow, it looks like Dharma, he's speaking Dharma. But it's, okay, I will not. A stuff short of saying more, <laughs> but yes, he, he does call out the capacity of overlooking things when you need to, and he says those are genius who could do it, and with afflictions also. Sometimes, as His Holiness sometimes slips into saying, 
In one point it's difficult for another point it's so easy. It is. It's all the mind that's doing, and then you have to just bring a try to the mind and say, "Come look here instead. Look, look, look here, look here, look here. Not there, but here, 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 here." And you go, "Ah, oh, so good." But then it when it turns, right? So in 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 one sense, it's so. So here and now, within our reach, always with us, inseparable with us, and can touch every ground with it, with that. It's like touching everywhere you go into gold. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of antidotes, I think there is uh, an, a statement in the auto commentary to Chandrakirti's entering the middle middle way, his own auto commentary on it, which is only his quite often cites, where he touches on this point of how ignorance is that the root of all afflictions, and any forceful antidote that can counteract it, can counteract all the afflictions. Whereas the affliction, the antidote, particularly to anger, cannot serve as an antidote to attachment and that of attachment, not to it. But the one to ignorance can deal with all. Right? So that part... Uh, so depending on where you find yourself, how the situation is, you could have a, a choice of antidotes. The first and foremost is run away. <laughs> run away you can do figuratively or symbolically. Even by staying, you could run away mentally, run away from it, right? And then you wouldn't be disturbed. Or you can kind of physically run away from them. Be and hung and hunker down during pandemic. It would have been the best thing to do. Hunker down, and what you do is you build your strength. Then face the affliction. Now come, then the affliction would even keep receding, not forcing forth. Until then, it's also one of the choices to do to run away, keep running away. Okay, then the last one. Conclude that the possibility to attain liberation exists within you. Now this hinges on first identifying the root of the afflictions and then seeing it to be not in alignment with the truth and how the truth could be understood and could be enhanced. And then the rest is natural. Because there are two such opposing forces that they cannot, they cannot sit together. They just oppose each other, right? So, by 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 mere signs of the forces of opposition, <laughs> you can deduce this. Conclude that the possibility of attain to attain liberation exists within you, within you because of your mind uh, in one in one uh, hand and then of the nature of the afflictions particularly the lot of ignorance on the other hand and how the the reality uh, lends itself le lends itself a more favorably to the fact of things being nothing but mere dependently related, of which the flip side is nothing has any inherent existence. So based on this, then you could generate this, strengthen this understanding. Yes, it is possible. Given your per pre precious human life, with all conducive factors for practicing 
the path, you have the ability to attain liberation and full awakening. Speaking of this, the practice of Lojong is very unique. The, the, the practice of Lojong doesn't ask for any conditions. It doesn't wait for any conditions. It doesn't say, no, conditions are not right. I wait for it. It doesn't say that. Come what may, it is, it's, it's about, able to transform it. That is called Lojong. And that's kind of a teaching that we really need in this so wonderful era of regenerations of afflictions. I mean, whatever it may be, it's, something is very clear. The afflictions seem to be stronger and, 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 and more prevalent and more expressed. I mean, on the other hand, the technological developments may be there, many new things may be there, but very little, very few are looking into the real source of the problem and looking outside. And because of that, not only they suffer more, but they completely overlook the afflictions within them, and they only increase it. And it is such a bad example to others, also. particularly when one happens to be a leader and facing the whole community and leading in those ways. And this is such a clear indication of what we in Tibetan call Nyingmanga Doa. Not just the time of degeneration, five degenerations, but time of a strong or ever increasing five degenerations. So, thinking along those lines, one could uh, generate a sense of confidence, yes, provided one makes efforts. One doesn't even have to wait for. One is already so adorned with the quality, with the conditions and whatnot, that one does not have to wait for any any additional condition. And, and even if the conditions were to be worsened, uh, one should become even more ready and more willing and more confident in, in turning it around through the Lojong practice. Okay, so that said, uh, we'll let the, spend the rest of this time in the questions. I better deal with the questions, otherwise there will be a backlog of them. <laughs> that my computer's back wouldn't have any space for my computer. There's a question about the relationship between self and mind in terms of there being separate entities. The questioner thinks that this, this particular quotation from Lamrim Chemo, where it says, from beginning less time, you have been under the control of your mind. Your mind has been not, not been under your control. Furthermore, your mind tended to be obscured by the afflictions and so forth. Thus, meditation aims to bring this mind, which gives rise to all falls and or which gives rise to all falls and flows under control. Thus, meditation aims to bring this mind under control, and then it aims to make it serviceable. So the questioner has this. I will read it. I had already been reflecting on this passage as part of my motivation, but I found myself a bit stuck. How can this be interpreted within the merely designated self rather than a self-sufficient, substantially existent self? Why? What is the... Uh, difficulty here. That is, the passage seems to imply that you, 
the cell and the and your mind are separate entities. How? Because one, the mind has controlled us. Now we are talking about ourselves controlling the mind. Uh, how would it uh, suggest or imply that they are two separate entities? They are definitely two things, uh, and two things could be two entities also. But when we are talking of entities here, it's almost like almost like separable. You keep yourself here, mind here. In that sense, they are not separate entities, but they are separate things capable of affecting and being affected by each other. And which has been happening uh, all through this time with the mind getting the upper hand. <laughs> now we are talking of ourselves getting the upper hand and put the mind on the back seat. And let's be the driver and go where we want, not where the mind wants. So, and that there is a symmet symmetry in either one being able to control the other. I don't understand how this is consistent with the mind being part of the basis of designation of the self, which seems like a very asymmetric relationship between the entities. That said, trying to extend the idea to other phenomena such as a car and its parts, I can imagine how the basis of designation or a part of it could be said to control the whole thing. But there you don't see a symmetry. There, the example itself has part of it controlling the whole. And why not person controlling the mind be also seen as at least par or equal controlling the other, not necessarily something above, over and above it. I can imagine how the basis of designation or a part of it could be said to control that which is designated, but I cannot imagine the reverse. The reverse here, here is the car controlling the parts of it. The car controls the others. When we sell cars, when people, when someone is looking for a car, somebody buys the car, and the parts have no choice but to go with them, <laughs> because the person has come there not to buy the parts but the car, and the car has to be car, which means necessarily with that part. Where the car is gone, the part has to go unwillingly or whatever. <laughs> That's how I got my parts of the car, although I didn't really know they were there in the first place. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, yeah, but it's very true that when we speak in such so, so strong terms, in terms of one being controlling the other, it, they do seem like they are separate entities. And in some philosophies, they would that would be the intent. But here, it's not. It is not it. Not not that. But nonetheless, still we can speak of the mind controlling the the, the person controlling the mind. By the way, it is not so far from the mind being able to control the person or mind being able to control do the controlling, because the person controls when the mind controls. Person does the controlling with the mind with the help of mind. We're just speaking a little differently. Otherwise, the actual work has to be done by the mind. Part of your being does something, the person gets the blame. But part, of your, part of your being does something, right? Part of your being, part of your physical, the body, the hand writes a good handwriting. Person has a good handwriting. He is a great calligraphy. And he writes very bad. Oh, he is not good, right? Poor person, he gets all the blame or the credits. But now here is a question when he is going to get the credit, 
is a question being raised. How come he can get the credit? Even there also, it's just the mind has to do the work. Except now, the mind, except here the person says, yes, you get to do this. Although, when the person says it, it's the mind itself again okay, saying it. <laughs> It's so interesting. That in Tibetan we call that in the scriptures it we call that Nyevar Lemba and Nyevar Langja. It's so in, in in English it is translated as appropriated and the appropriator. I, I don't know how that comes across because with the English language I don't have any feeling. <laughs> I don't have any feeling. So when it comes to dealing with cultural things like saying something in that situation. I have great difficulty. Sometimes I would have something written and I would confide in someone say, please, this is the situation, pick it, how culturally proper it is. And I get it, said it. When it comes to explaining things like that, it's kind of impersonal, right? That's right. How did we get here? How did we get here? Yes, yeah. So appropriated and the appropriator. So this is speaking of the relationship between the designated and the and the and the the de, the basis of designation and the designation. Yeah, they are called never lembab never lembabo and never langja, appropriator and the appropriated. It's always through the appropriated that the appropriator gets to do or gets to be called. Nothing independent of it, like in the case of the person. It's always part of him doing something that he's called for doing that or not that or not that. Other than that, the person cannot, without the help of his aggregates, cannot do anything. So even saying the mind, person can control the mind, it has to be, it's one of its appropriated basis of designation that has to do the job. <laughs> they have to wait now on whom the job will fall. <laughs> okay. Now there is another question. This, the, the third one seems to be uh, connected. This may not be suitable for the SNBN series. I am calling this the state of samsara address. The state of the union? The state of samsara address. Sorry, samsara has not changed a bit. <laughs> if at all, it has gone worse. Be warned, the price of samsara will keep going up. The price you pay being in samsara will keep going up because its state is not good. It has not improved. So I'm here to keep the state of the samsara address every time. So this is fitting with the samsara. This may not be suitable for the S and B and series, but the question has come up in relation to the four establishments. Reflecting on how the mind enters the fertilized egg and the very fragile connection between body and mind throughout life. The question of what on the earth is connecting these two things, or one physical and one non-physical. It's a big question. I better come up with a big answer. <laughs> Otherwise, there will be a mismatch, right? It has to squarely fit. Yeah, one thing. So, from a strict Buddhist perspective, in the samsara, the force behind that is karma. Affliction, deep and karma. Yeah. And then, in terms of what karma ripens, Ripening, what karma ripens means, what 
what body it takes, what state it, what state a person will be, right? And that's uh, the karma that decides. And in terms of within the karmas, there was this statement, uh, quotation from a sutra that is quoted in Lamrim Shemu. Talks about wow, the more grave it is, it will ripen first, and then, and then one is very interesting. Among the among the karmas you have accumulated, the gravest one would ripen first. But if there is not the gravest one, what would be the next one? Pardon? Let you cover chicken and never can come back. Happy still comes third. Nearest to what? Yes, nearest at the time of death. Although the scripture says whatever manifests during during the time of death. So one has to be so in some scriptures it really warns against what you wish for. And 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 leave that chance of wishing for that or even having a glimpse of it at the time of death. That could influence the next direction. So it's very definitely very fragile. <laughs> the question is the question of why consciousness is able to take up and reside in this formulation of earth, water, fire, and wind, but not other combinations is also coming up. What are the other combinations? Do you remember uh, on the very first Mind and Life conference, His Holiness did uh, express the possibility that uh, if computers are developed in such a way that they could sustain life, they could be Mr. Computer, please, could you please do this? Tuck, 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 like that. They, they could be a person in it. And then the body that we are thinking of is not necessarily a static one. It's not going to be humans like us. They could be humans all the time, but not like us. We evolve. We, we, we evolve. We change. We change. And so, on that regard, the evolution theory, I don't think, is any, 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 anything in con con conflict, because it only speaks of the change pat pattern on the surface. It, it could change. And besides that, in the Buddhist parlance, we speak of so many different types of bodies. So many different types of bodies. We cannot say this kind of a body yeah, per se. And besides, there are bodies which have no. He says, there are persons, we have no bodies. <laughs> okay, we can touch on this next time, because the answer I gave hasn't been as big. Let me build up on it, and then we'll see. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's call it a session. Yes. Yeah, so I encourage you all, in particular those who are very enthusiastically listening from Singapore, to really take these reflections seriously and make them the theme of your meditation and kind of really look forward to exploring it. Yeah, thank you.